Over four days in early September, Iraqi fighter pilots carried out 15 airstrikes against Islamic State targets in the Salahuddin and Kirkuk provinces, just north of Baghdad. It had been more than a year since ISIS had captured Mosul, Iraq's second largest city, prompting the intervention of a U.S.-led coalition. And these terrorists are learning the same thing that the leaders of Al-Qaeda have learned the hard way. Our reach is long. We do not give up. You will have no safe haven. Airstrikes had targeted ISIS territories for much of that year. So 15 more carried out by four Iraqi planes might not seem to change the fight in any fundamental way. But how those pilots came to be flying those airplanes in the skies over their home country, that was a big change indeed. In the 1980s, Iraq had been the most feared air power in the Middle East, with more than a thousand aircraft. But many of those were destroyed by the United States in the first Gulf War, and the 2003 American invasion completed the destruction. By 2004, the Iraqi Air Force had just 35 personnel and zero aircraft. In late 2011, with American forces pulling out of Iraq and taking their air superiority with them, Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki purchased 36 brand new F-16s from the United States, the first F-16s in the country's history. The roughly $6 billion cost included sending a couple dozen pilots to America for F-16 training. They started at San Antonio's Lackland Air Force Base, where they spent four months learning English. Then it was on to Laughlin Air Force Base in Del Rio, Texas, where they took the Air Force's introductory flying course, proving themselves on the single prop T-6 Texan II. From there, they advanced to the dual jet T-38 Talon at Columbus Air Force Base in Mississippi. Then it was back to San Antonio, this time to Randolph Air Force Base for eight more months in the T-38. Finally, they headed to Tucson International Airport, home of the 162nd Fighter Wing of the Arizona Air National Guard. Over four decades, the 162nd Wing has trained pilots from dozens of countries to fly the F-16. This is the place to come if you're going to uh, get trained in the F-16 because of our experience, our background, and uh, the relationships we've had with other countries. We build a program very similar to what U.S. pilots will go through. It's a complicated, sophisticated platform. It takes some time to be good at it. Um, obviously, our airspace and our, our uh, weather make it a fantastic benefit as well. In fact, take away the towering saguaros, and the Sonoran Desert looks a lot like Iraq, especially from the sky. But on the ground, America is so much different. At first, when we came to the United States, it was pretty hard. It was different culture, for sure, between Iraq and the United States. The food was different, daily life is different. So we kind of suffered in the beginning. This is one of the Iraqi pilots. Due to security concerns, the Iraqi Ministry of Defense would not allow photography or on-camera interviews with the pilots. They did, however, grant one phone interview on the condition of anonymity. We had a uh, history together as uh, Iraqi uh, government and the uh, United States government. You know, we had uh, the Gulf War in uh, 2003. Uh, so uh, some of the people, they get a bad idea too, to be honest. Uh, as, uh, they don't say it exactly, but uh, you can't feel it that they have some kind of concern about you being Iraqi right here. But after the first year, it got easier and we got adopted to the uh, American culture. We got into like American sport. For me, I watch uh, basketball a lot and watching the uh, San Antonio uh, Spurs, I like it, I really like it. Most foreign trainees are at the 162nd wing for seven or eight months. Then they return home to train as wingmen with veteran pilots from their own militaries. The Iraqi pilots couldn't go home to train with veteran F-16 pilots because there were no veteran F-16 pilots in Iraq. And when the first pilots became mission qualified in 2014, Balad Air Base, the jet's future home, was threatened by ISIS. It was frustrating for the pilots to remain in Tucson while ISIS systematically tore their country apart. The uh, before you fly, you watch the news. You see 
the, the car bomb exploded in Baghdad or one city that's nearby your house. Does you have a different time? You called back home, they may ask me, or they will be having a dinner, or they may not answer the, the phone, and you'll be thinking about it um, all day long until you get something uh, answered back. Pretty uh, strange feeling that you'll get when you uh, start to think about that your, your home is got invaded by a terrorist group. And when we go back home, it's our cities that we bombed. But it also brought them closer together. Just recently, uh, it was a very eye-opening experience for me when I asked uh, an Iraqi student. I said, "You know, what are you? You know, a Shiite, Sunni, or Kurd? Uh, just out of curiosity to see uh, where they're from and, and you know to get a background. Not that it had anything to do with the instruction I was going to give them or anything. It was just to learn about them yeah. and." Uh, he says to me, I am an Iraqi. The father figure of the group, nearly twice as old as the rest, was Brigadier General Rashid Mohammed Sadiq Hassan, a graduate of the Iraqi Air Force Academy who only flew for a short time before the first Gulf War and all that followed, essentially grounded him for two decades. He was the one the young pilots turned to when the grueling training or worry about their families became too much. Hassan had been married for as long as some of them had been alive, and had four kids, his youngest son born just months before he left for America. General Hassan was just a, a good family man. Um, every occasion that he could talk about his children, he did, um, how much he missed them, and just um, he would speak with them daily. Hassan would soon get the chance to see his wife and kids. The delivery of the first four F-16s had finally been scheduled for mid-July, and after nearly four years in the United States, Hassan was booked on a June 26th Turkish Airlines flight back to Iraq. He was supposed to be in one of those F-16s that, come September, would bomb ISIS. But there were still a couple last training flights before he left. The night of June 24th, two days before his return home, Hassan once more climbed into his plane, streaked down the runway, and shot off into the Arizona sky. Hello, and thanks for joining us tonight at 6. I'm Guy Atchley. And I'm Stella Ingerwell. Almost 24 hours after an F-16 fighter jet crash near Douglas, there is no word on whether the pilot is dead or alive. The Air Force is still investigating what went wrong. It was a routine night training mission, a two-plane formation with an American pilot on one wing. An eyewitness told the newspapers he saw the plane bank left and then just tumble out of the sky. Only when the smoldering stopped a day later were hazmat teams able to search for a body. Hassan was the first Iraqi F-16 pilot to die in training, and only the second pilot to die in the history of the 162nd Wing's F-16 program. It was a big uh, shock because he was the first fatality. It was a big impact on the pilot's career for, uh, for the first couple of days. Uh, we were thinking about it a lot. The Iraqis were given a week off after the crash to mourn, but they found the best way of coping was being in the air. When you sit in the jet, you feel like you are by yourself. You are not sitting in the jet, you are just, you have wings and you are flying by yourself. There's a saying, it says that if you, the jet, uh, if you didn't think about flying for a second or two, uh, there's something wrong. Uh, you have to be uh, thinking all the time about flying. And what's next, what's next, what's next? When they finish, when they are mission qualified, the pilots will leave as they came, in groups of four, in pairs, or alone, adding their firepower to the fight against ISIS, one F-16 at a time. Hassan never got the chance, but he will always be remembered in Tucson. His name was engraved on a memorial commemorating members of the 162nd Wing who have died. Men with names like Dale, Willie, Bruce, James, Harry, Jack, Hassan, Rashid Mohammed Sadiq. It barely fits on one line, but it fits.